Patricia's going to be uh, this morning to present you some of the issues and, and, and the aspects of dealing with uh, Saboa. Uh, Craig didn't mention that Harry Prince, though, but he was the first chair, he was the first CEO of Saboa when it was established in 1980 and in offices in Randburg. So, uh, what we have here today, of course, all the hard work that he's putting into the association and establishing it as a voice of the industry over the years. So, thank you very much for that. Um, let's just see where this thing yeah. We yeah, have four main themes that I'd like to discuss uh, today with you. Uh, first of all, the Consumer Protection Act. I know that we discussed this last year. I've done some developments around this that's very important for us to consider. Road safety in the bus industry and the four types of contracts. Uh, I know that Gordon will also talk about that. It's a, it's a discussion as well as a topic. But uh, we have a few opinions as an industry around these four types of contracts. <coughs> then last year we did a survey amongst industry uh, uh, oper amongst operators in the industry about uh, the issues and implementation matters around policy in South Africa and then some conclusions and all this. Um, the Consumer Protection Act, I think you're all very familiar with it, poses a number of challenges to the industry. And I'm only going to highlight three areas at this point in time. Uh, one would have thought we could have dealt with this effectively, but uh, it's not the case at this stand here. Firstly, uh, section 33 on the disclosure of prices. Uh, the view of the industry is, is that it's impossible for an operator, especially the larger operator, to display their prices in any one place or any one display area to the size and scope of their businesses. And this is something we have to take up with, with, the, with the commission. Uh, sales records, uh, although the new ticketing machines that we see outside here are costing about 40,000 rand a piece, can do this. Most of the equipment that we have that we're operating cannot comply with the Consumer Protection Act. Uh, it wants information such as supplies full name, registered business name, bank registration number, list of premises, date in which the transaction occurred, name and description of the services that we supply, and so on. A whole list of, of information that we cannot supply and most of the tickets that we are machine at this point in time. Um, and then if you look at section 63.2, which I think is our main problem as an industry uh, around the ticket validity, uh, it says the following in the, in the act itself, a prepaid certificate, card, credit voucher, or similar device that uh, does not expire until the earlier of the following, the date on which its full value has been redeemed, or three years after the date it was issued. And this is a huge problem because most of our tickets do expire on a weekly basis and also on a monthly basis shortly after the deadline. Um, and then the third area that's very concerning, any consideration paid by the consumer to a supplier is a property of the bearer of that certificate, card, credit, voucher, or similar device to the extent that the supplier is not redeemed it in exchange for goods or services or future access or service. In other words, that, that money is, is not your money, it remains this of, 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 the, of your customer itself. The implications of this is that in passenger transport systems throughout the world, and this is rail as well, not only uh, bus systems, tickets lapse shortly after the defined period on the ticket, whether this, this ticket has been used or not. In our view, they should continue to lapse for many good reasons. An extended validity period will provide a large, larger incentive, for instance, for drivers and passengers to avoid cancellations, in other words, fraud. Companies also prefer to sell multi-journey tickets as it limits the amount of cash in the bus, which in turn discourages debt and drivers being robbed. We've had many cases of drivers being robbed and also killed uh, for maybe 30 or 40 rand on the bus. And passengers <coughs> also benefit from these multi-journey tickets, weekly and monthly tickets that are sold at a discount. So there's a benefit for the passengers as well in buying a weekly or monthly ticket. The requirements uh, the section 63 will mean uh, major changes to ticketing systems and control procedures. And uh, this will have to be improved at a very large cost to operators or to minimize revenue losses. All of the commuter operators, uh, especially those on, on, the, on the DOT uh, subsidy scheme and also the local authorities, <coughs> on monthly or slightly longer contract terms, uh, to now invest in expensive equipment does not make sense. Um, and secondly, the contracts prescribe particular equipment, as we'll see uh, when we go into these integrated transport plans. 
And that's a big inconsistency of why we're capable of functioning these integrated systems is not known at this point in time. We haven't had contracts since 2008 to make major investments now, particularly in equipment that can meet these requirements. So it's very convenient. We need to entice material to smart car systems, for instance. We have obtained a legal opinion from the Senior Council, and it indicates that Section 63 is not applicable to the industry. In other words, our tickets, weekly and monthly tickets, are not applicable. And there are similar legal opinions that, we, that has been obtained by operators in the industry that supports this. But the Commission apparently disregards these opinions uh, and discussions with Metro Rail and other institutions around this, and they say the same thing. The Consumer Commission has given notice that the industry will be investigated uh, around its compliance with the Consumer Protection Act. And we've requested a meeting with the, with the, with the Commission, which they've agreed to, we just wait for the date to meet with them on this, but they've agreed to meet with the industry first in order to actually go out to the different companies. Uh, we've had uh, discussions, not formal discussions, but I've had a number of uh, chances to talk to uh, uh, senior management of Metro Rail, as well as Hard Train 101, and they both face the same problem. Um, and there's an in principle agreement that these three industries will actually work together to try and overcome the problems uh, that the CPA poses at this point in time. What's also encouraging, uh, although we did approach the DOT, prior to the act being enacted uh, to assist us in dealing with these issues we did not make it way right then. But uh, what I've heard now and the interactions I've had with, with the DOT is that they're also equally concerned about this whole thing and that uh, they've indicated that they've set up a meeting with Metro Rail, Hard Train and also Sabola. And this first meeting takes place next week. And ideas to go through the ministries to deal with the uh, with this specific matter in the Senior Commission. So uh, I, think, I think it's very important that we deal with this. Uh, I think we could have a 10% fine of your turnover, for instance, if you don't comply with the Commission. And we know there's a big case where we're going to cell phone companies at this point in time. Uh, road safety. I think the last festive season again focused the attention on, on road safety matters. Uh, on average, 39 people die on our roads every day. I mean, it's, it's like a war out there. And uh, thousands are injured, and the cost of those injuries are really huge. And we cannot tolerate this any longer. And we believe that the new approach to road safety is, is required. I mean, we've had a reduction in accidents, but it's really at the margins, not, not fully. And we believe that uh, we, we need to look at it more systematically, more holistically, look at the entire value chain of, of role plays within uh, road traffic accidents, incidents, and so on. And there's been many good examples of Argentina, for instance, for the World Bank interventions, where they've had fantastic results in, in, in reducing the accident rates. We've been very much involved in, from technical side and also the inputs to the Bureau of Standards and so on to assist in road safety per se, through vehicle design standards, roller protection of buses, seat anchorage points, maximum speeds of 100 kilometers per hour, which came in after all those accidents we had a number of years ago, I think 1999, 100 kilometers speed limit, six monthly COFs, which we've proposed for a long time, although there are problems with the implementation around this, I think the industry supports this quite well. Insurance schemes for operators, which really force operators to maintain the vehicles in the road building condition, so that when they have claims that the road willingness is not an issue. Uh, and especially the Aon, the Aon scheme that we have, Lena and Aon, um, we have over 2,500 buses, mostly of small operators, on the Aon scheme at this point in time. Um, the industry is also highly unionized. Uh, we work in conditions are regulated by a bargaining council. They have boss obligation requirements, major involvement in participation in training programs for staff and drivers, and group that I'll issue around group tracks, emergency exits, and so on. So last year in September, in response to many initiatives of government around road safety, we made certain proposals to the Road Traffic Management Corporation and the Minister of Transport that we believe can make a difference. And these include, for instance, Road Safety Summit. Um, I don't think we've had a, a thorough summit, well, well planned summit, to deal with what are the real causes of accidents, or what, how can we deal with it holistically, and what proposals can be made around that. We also propose that the Permanent Road Safety Council be established. 
but also with feet in the different provinces. Uh, because provincially, different provinces are quite different characteristics of provinces and so on. But the permanent road safety council, I think, can also send a good signal out there that there's real seriousness around uh, road safety matters. We believe that we should review the operator's licensing system, the old permit system. Currently, all the focus is on the vehicle. Whilst the operator is not required to provide any proof that he or she is capable of managing a business. It's also not the requirement that the operator must provide proof that he or she has facilities or knowledge or access to maintain access to supplies for instance, to maintain a vehicle in a low condition. We also make proposals around that operators' managerial staff should be accredited through something like an operator's license, like you have in England, for instance. We have, if you get no license, before you start operating. Um, so we know that people uh, are, have the minimum skills to manage a fleet, um, especially if being involved in public transport. <coughs> we also propose that, that there should be consideration of some ISO quality standard manage, uh, system for public transport operators specifically, that will deal with just systems, managerial and safety practices, etc. This will ensure uniform safety standards and can be linked to a star grading system, as an example. We also believe there should be greater consensus of how buses should be tested for roadworthiness, especially along the roads. We had instances where brand new buses were pulled over for playing the steering mechanism. Brand new buses, two, three days old, where these officers sit in the vehicle and turn the steering wheel and say they're playing the system. And so we believe there should be some more, there should be more standards around this and should uh, receive attention. The, test, the number of testing stations we think is also important, especially in the Gauteng area. There are not enough of these testing stations around. We believe the PRDP system should be reviewed. And we have found, for instance, that drivers that have just gone through a test uh, for the PRDPs often fail company tests afterwards. There may be fraud in the system itself. And we know what the problem is around cannabis. Uh, the, people smoke dach. I mean, they cannot pick it up easily in the bloodstreams of people. And um, we believe one should, uh, uh, we should look at that area as well that, uh, as part of, of this initiative. We also believe that this arrival life campaign that we've had in December is very really active and very really visible, and we'll probably have it again in, 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 in April, should be rolled out countrywide 365 days a year. Effective law enforcement really throughout the year. There's also a belief that we should assist small operators to finance the recapitalization of the fleets, replacement of vehicles, and so on. But not only small, but also uh, the operators. There's also room, we believe, and we've done a survey now recently, and we're visiting the results, that we should set up a driver academy for training of bus and taxi drivers in the industry. And then, obviously, road safety, road, uh, road infrastructure improvement. And yesterday, we heard a lot about this in Parliament, and how much money being spent on roads. Uh, it does cause a lot of damage to our vehicles and unroadworthiness in, in our vehicles. But the interesting thing is we didn't even have a response, either from the RPC or from the Department of Transport, the Minister of Transport. Um, you know, we felt serious about this. It was not something you just suck out of your thumb and a piece of paper for the sake of doing it. It looked good. It was really an effort that we put into our proposals. And we really looked, and when we interacted with the RPC again, we were asking what the opinions are around uh, the specific area. We are currently busy investigating road safety. Something before the industry plays a something at the back there is driving it on half of Savoa, and uh, we believe it will also make a difference. But we need to work with government and its agencies. Agencies like the RFMC don't exist in the home. They must work with the people that have regulated, not against them or ignore them. And uh, I think that's one of, one of the areas of concern to have these agencies. Are. In many, in this specific case, I think a bit vindictive as well in our dealings with the industry. On the contracting documents, these are four very important documents. Um, we have the members of the task team of the DOT, um, to walk here, leading the task team. I can say, I warned her, I can say a few things about this, but she has some counter responses to me in her talk a bit later on. Uh, it's a very important area for us. Um, to nail down effectively, because this is the way in which operators will contract in future with uh, the contracting authority at the local authority or provincial authority uh, level. And if you can't get this right, 
I've got to this playing field where people want to invest more, invest sufficiently. Uh, or the pricing will be wrong because of risks that are perceived by operators to be inherent in the system, speech level 7 and 12 year contracts, which, which are really envisaged. So we commented in detail on, on the following contracts. We negotiated net cost contract, negotiated gross cost contract, and if you look at the net cost contract, that's where the operator takes the revenue risk, but you negotiate the services with the operator. Then the gross cost contracts with the authority takes the revenue risk, and you adjust the operator contract with the number of kilometers that you have to operate within the service. But the revenue risk is not with you, it's with the authority. Then the tender net cost contract, which is what we currently have in the tendering system. So the tender for net cost and the revenue risk is, is, is your, your problem. And then the tender gross cost contract as another alternative. So uh, we've had a number of workshops um, as an industry and we've commented in detail around these documents to the DOT. Uh, one of our problems is that this task team has not met for some time. Uh, we've, but we received a letter in the last week uh, could be Monday this week as well, where the task will actually get together next week. So it, the argument falls away a bit, but the problem we've had is that we've put many comments forward on these documents, but they were never really discussed. It's as if, you know, you see the documents, you comment, you never hear it again. They were, things remain the same after you comment. You know. But hopefully we can make some progress on some of the issues I've got to mention <coughs> around these documents. Amongst the issues that we've identified that that in discussion on the following, the removal of conditions of subcontracting from all the documents. Um, we don't see sub subcontracts being removed from all the documents. The first documents we saw had subcontracting. That's a very important principle for us because um, prior to the tendering system being put on hold uh, in 2002, we had nearly 640 buses of small operators incorporated as subcontractors or joint ventures in those contracts. And it's, it's meaningful, it's a meaningful number of buses that, that were included. And now it's been taken out. The question is what's in its place? Uh, you know, uh, we don't know at this point in time. So there's no clarity on how SMBs will be empowered. Um, as I've mentioned, 640 buses we had up until 2002 in the system. And it, it appears to us as a set aside of form part of the session. We haven't seen it yet in writing stuff in the policy documents as well. Um, the idea was that subcontracting will actually take precedence of this, of this set of sites. And, and it's important to look at this in, in, in perspective. Uh, we prepared this slide. And if you look at the taxi industry, this is, this is the, this whole area is the taxi industry, 140 taxis, which will equate to about 35,000 bus capacity vehicles. We have about 5,000 buses amongst SMEs, as an example. In this group in here, there are also other bus companies that are not subsidized, that are not included. Yet. So, you're looking at a potential about 40,000 plus buses out there that, that will be looking at participating in the, in, the, in the subsidy system. At the moment, there are about 7,500 buses on contracts throughout the country. Of those, about 6,200 are members of Sabah. So, it's not all of those buses. Um, that are members of Sabah. And if we have a set aside, say for instance of 20 or 30 percent here, you can, you can see very clearly that in relation to the actual demand out there versus what is being set aside here, it won't make a big difference. Uh, even if you look at 30 percent of that 7,000 buses, you look at maybe 2,000 potential buses that could be set aside if that's a percentage. And we don't necessarily agree with it. But look at this huge demand out there. You cannot deal with it. It's too big. What's the solution for us is that you have to grow this entire industry. And I mean, if you look at what uh, um, Tom Gordon said yesterday and the President said about two weeks ago, we need to focus more on public transport. And to focus on public transport by not growing this area is going to be very problematic. And taking away here and giving to other people, but not growing it. I mean, what happens to the companies that are operating in these areas? Like the fixed, the investments, no rates. It's a huge issue. We should grow this industry to do commercial contracts, expanded public transport service contracts, tourism, long distance shuttle services, scholars, tourism, tourism charters, and so on. 
But especially if you look at urban areas, you have to grow this cake and, and make it more available, more uh, accessible to more users. We should not cut up what we have and redistribute with our grain industry. And this is, I think, a major debate that we have to have with government as an industry as to how, how are we going to deal with this huge demand out there, but the limited size of the cake to evaluate what. I mean, how will they choose among all these people who's going to get a slice of this existing cake? We should actually grow the industry to accommodate the new role players. <coughs> There's also a clause in this document uh, that um, the escalation section of it, where the Division of Revenue Act, uh, the law of allocation overrides the entire escalation formula in the contracts. It's right at the beginning of that section. And this is hugely problematic. Um, and that contracts can be as long as 12 years. And at present, the door escalation is almost always below the agreed escalation formula in the respective contracts. I mean, the escalation formula is now, say, 5 6%, and this will be 1 or 2%. Uh, but it depends on what treasury has available. And you cannot work in the business under these circumstances. You cannot plan long term, invest over long term. If you don't know, that some of the risks that you, that you face will actually be uh, nullified by, uh, um, by this collection. And, and, and to say yes, but yeah, the passengers should pay more. We know the limited capacity of passengers to pay more for our services. It's one of the hindrances that we have as a country. I'm certainly being unemployed, uh, not spending uh, as much as you know, people driving in cars and so on. So our limits as to what we can put through to the passengers themselves. And this, but this specific year is very problematic, um, and this will need thorough discussion. We cannot have an override clause like that within the contract of seven years or twelve years. Uh, Dora should not face it. Dora is actually a short-term arrangement that was was sold up as two three years ago, and was implemented. And all the contracts were converted to include the Dora's collection. Um, there are also clauses to the effect that. The, Contracting authority may purchase the bus depots from operators. We don't know why it's in there. Why it's in these contracts? It serves no purpose. I mean, if, it, if an operator wants to sell a depot, it's, it's a commercial agreement. It's a separate agreement from the actual contract of rendering the services. Um, and there's, there's concern that if you sign these contracts, you in a way also agree that you know, your depots may be sold to, to government. The government may Appropriate your, your depots and so on, and uh, this is an area that we've commented on extensively. There's also an insistence that a percentage of private higher income should go to the contracting authority based on the reasoning that the subsidy that the operators have received in part funds a capital cost to I mean, this is entirely new. And this is one area where the operators could still make money and maybe <coughs> tendering and negotiating their service, take that into account, you know, having lower rates. <laughs> in the face of competition and so on. And now there's this clause in here that there's this belief that they're also finding the capital costs. And um, I mean, this, this is the case. The same reasoning must apply to, for instance, road building contracts, that they claim the percentages of the capital uh, or the profits that road, road building companies would have, and they construct roads, you know, through trucks and steamrollers or whatever they use to construct roads. And we don't see it in those contracts. It's the same principle. And, and we'll have to talk about this. There's also an operator performance management system included. But I, I don't know where I can meet the requirements of that, of that performance management system. Um, <coughs> leave alone the small operators involved in these contracts. To meet this is going to be virtually impossible. It's like a first world design uh, you know, um, that you have here in a developing country with poor road conditions, uh, many problems around operations and so on. And, and, and the extension of the contract from 7 to 12 years is based amongst other this performance management systems that have been there. It's never been discussed and I, I see a huge difficulty in implementing this within the industry. The exclusion of specific legal types in, draft document, in the draft documents that could be beneficial to operators and the contracting authority of life. Uh, I mean, we've seen some of the vehicles out here. In addition, the wording to the effect that other vehicle types will not be paid on the differentiated scale from the standard bus specifications in the contract. There can be benefits for both parties in operating larger plastic vehicles, maybe lower frequencies, and better utilization of these vehicles. And there should be an incentive for operators to really exploit the economics of these contracts through different vehicle types and specifications. 
and with no flexibility as far as that's concerned. Then there are massive penalties. In some instances, five pounds might be present penalties. I mean, 10,000 rand not operating the service after the weekend. Per zip, per bus. Um, we don't know where it comes from. If it's an issue, if it's rather than it's an issue in, in a, from a managerial point of view, then I'm building the big stick and I'm 10,000 rand fine for not operating specific service. Discuss the problem with the operators and over the Solve it from a policy point of view. And these types of fines are very normal. We believe that if you look at the contracting documents, the complexity will even, be, will, you know, if you look at the entire document, will be difficult to establish operators, let alone the SMEs. I mean, SMEs are getting into the industry, the small businesses. I mean, yesterday we heard that the requirements of reporting for small businesses now not eight times a year, but only twice a year. They're simplifying the procedures for small business. But here we have a contract that, in my view, is really fits very well in first world circumstances not in a developing country that tries to empower small business and grow small business. Enough said about that. If you look at the, if you look at the uh, policy process in South Africa, I've had this up before, uh, we have the white paper, interim contracts for subsidized operators, the tried to try to hit some agreement in 1999, National Land Transfer Position Act in 2000, they were tended to negotiate the contracts that began after these uh, the interim contracts were concluded for this period, 1997 to uh, 2002 for tender, and 2004 for negotiated contracts. We met the National Land Transport Act, and then and now we're busy with these uh, integrated transport plans based on the Land Transport Act being developed the different um, local uh, metropolitan governments. Um, yeah, I want to go uh, through this table. I, I don't want to run out of time. You can tell me there's a red light for me, but. Um, can I still carry on a bit? But public transport uh, tendering has come to a halt in 2002, and we've had a few negotiated contracts up until 2004. It's very clear that tendering itself is a major problem for the unions, and they have a huge opposition to, to the tendering system itself. Um, and, and there are many issues around this that we've not solved, which I'll mention in maybe just a few. Uh, the one is, for instance, uh, section 197 of the Labor Relations Act. And there were proposed amendments to 197 that's now being debated at NEDLAC. Uh, we don't believe it changes materially the meaning of 197. But the Department of Transport, the Department of Labor, and organized labor believe that based on the current South African labor legislation, as we have it now, but we believe also the amended version of it, all the employees of incumbent operators should be transferred after the tender based on the going concern business principle of the new operator. Uh, we haven't seen this in other types of government contracts, but this is the view of these role players. The major problems that we are facing around this is, for instance, surplus personnel on right size contracts. And I've showed you the set-asides that, that, that we may have some like set-asides. What happens to the personnel that lose their work in that type of scenario? How do you deal with those personnel? What personnel of such businesses, how do, uh, you know, where do they go to? The disclosure of sensitive remuneration information, because you know, if, if, if you go, if you transfer the people from one business to another, you must know what you're in for from a labor cost point of view. You can't tell if you don't know what the cost of the previous incumbent operator is. Um, to arrange a range of bidders, bidding against you, so they can take that into consideration in bidding. The splitting of personnel between various contracts should, should an existing contract be split into smaller parts, for instance. And operators facing various labor dispensations, I mean, you could have three or four different labor dispensations in one workshop, as an example, with one in, and also in part of the general operating environment. So we did a survey amongst our members. Um, the aim of the survey was to determine the industry's opinion regarding governance and implementation matters related to public transport. And um, it was conducted amongst the 18 larger uh, subsidized operators in the country in, in, in towards August last year, uh, July, August last year. And we had a very high response rate. I think we had 17 of the 18 countries responding, and the 18th one came in after we concluded all the, the calculation. You might not be able to write, read this, but let me do it uh, from here. The most important governance issues around the governance side. Regarding the implementation of the contracting systems, the following. 
the inability of the permit offices to effectively deal with operator licenses. This came out right at the top. Open call seven out of five of all operators that responded to the permit office. I mean, this has been going on for years. The issues around the permit office, the ineffectiveness, the, the tardiness, the, the lack, lack of quick responses, for instance, to applications and amendments. And we have not solved this. I mean, if you look at the Land Transport Act, there are new proposals there, but it's not been implemented. And yet we're still sitting right now today, sitting with this governance issue, uh, a very basic issue around public transport in the country. Second one, lack of continuity at the provincial level of government. What it means is that you have people, you have, you have an election, and you have officials are working now, then you have an election. After election, there are brand new people from the top to just about the, the, the normal officials. And then that everything is revisited, rethought, uh, new directions, new strategies, and so on. So as if there's no continuity in the thinking around public transport. They cannot do this every five years. You have to have a longer term period of investment point of view, development point of view, and so on. You should transcend that. Uh, lack of policy direction at the provincial level government third. Slow progress made in the development of integrated transport plans. Um, I don't know if any of these plans that have been completed, uh, because that is the next phase. We go out to tender and negotiate the contracts. These plans will serve as the basis upon which it will happen. I don't know if any of these, if you've not been asked to comment on any, any of these documents at this point in time. Um, lack of direction and integration of transport modes into a single transport system. I mean, we're talking about it. integrating the taxis and the SMEs into our public transport system. But what have we done around it practically? Do we know what the issues are? I mean, if, you look at the, if you look at the DRT in Johannesburg, the difficulty to incorporate all the role players on, on, on a route. Yeah, a DRT is going on for a long time. And you can just imagine the complexities and difficulties around this. You look at the network of services. There are no guidelines. In my view, there's nothing being done really involved in anything like that. And then, again, with the permit site, poor education on uh, process such as permit applications, uh, 3.3. Uh, and there are a whole lot of things, so I'm not going to go through all of them now. Um, the next one, something blocks back to the implementation of the contracting system. What did the operators do? What are the major issues? The first one came out at 4.67 out of 5. A contract design is based on the availability of funds and not the real demand for services. And, I mean, if you look at if you look at uh, supplement, if you look at uh, set aside, for instance, it, uh, you're not looking at more money, you're looking at taking from what we have and sharing that, which is not always a bad principle, but we need to grow our public transport systems in the country. Everybody's saying that, kind of guess that as well. And, but we have limited funds. And we always hear that there'll be more funds available if we have ITPs in place, um, but we haven't seen any specific strategies around that to support. Uh, to support that. The complexity is involved in, uh, in, the complexity is involving taxi operators, SME and bus operators in the contracting system. I mean, you have different types of businesses. You have formal businesses and you have like informal businesses that, that are not formalized from systems point of view, you know, reporting systems and so on. And if you look at the complexities of things, the contracting documents, there's a huge task here by head of us in empowering these small operators in understanding these documents, deal with the documents effectively and they are, and they are being contracted into these systems. So the reporting requirements that they have any business is significant. It's very complex. And there's, you don't see anything around this. And you can't to decide to do this and say in three months' time and then, you know, uh, and then hope everything will be fine. This is a process we have to go through empowering people to be empowered when they get involved in these contracts. Um, the cost that will be associated with the implementation of the transport plans. We have no idea what this is going to cost us. No idea. But we're including, we hopefully we're including more operators into the system. It's like this national health scheme. Unfortunately, there's now a slower movement towards that. Uh, and we've also now seen that in Cape Town, now been decided in this last week, that they'll pilot the transport transport plans in Cape Town to see what the issues are, the complexities of it, uh, and so on. So that's also step in the right direction. You can't go all this thing out countrywide to work and then stop the process. We've had too many stops, for instance, in our 
public transport policies over the years because we can't afford it, we can't implement it, we can't make objects and so on. Um, if you look at major issues in the further implementation of competitive tenders, the funding issues, 4.4, complexities of integrated bus and taxis again, complexity of integration of various operators and integrated process plans, and, and then the, the capacity, the fourth one there, lack of capacity to implement uh, this whole system. Uh, we don't, I don't think we have the capacity in the country to implement these complicated systems at this point in time. On negotiated contracts, um, we tested the opinion of operators. It's very clear that the preferences is for a negotiated contract gross-based. 85.7% uh, of operators and key cameras are in support of negotiated contracts and it is the direction that the understanding policy of the government is going. It will be negotiated gross cost contracts. The second preference for negotiated contract net cost, <coughs> and then the third competitive tender contract the gross cost, and then competitive tender net cost, which is one we actually have in place. It's not widely supported. Then. I think it's because there are so many risks from a patterning's point of view and the design of these contracts that you sit with afterwards. So it's clear that the operators of opinion that the risk, the revenue risk should be transferred to the forest, like we have with the VRT at this point. Uh, other views on the implementation of negotiated contracts, because this is the way we're going. Uh, the big concern that we have amongst these operators is that they have to give away the set aside principle, a part of their businesses. In the face of a huge demand out there that's not being met, uh, if, you look at, uh, the, the ten, if you look at the contracting system they have now with the DOT based these contracts, there's not been a single new route approved since 2002 in this country. I mean, it's 10 years, 10, 11 years, and we have huge growth in our urban areas, uh, sprawl, and so on. It's not being met effectively. Um, the, the big disparity, for instance, of uh, the scope of bus operations that need to be accommodated in future contracts. If you look at some of the existing services and how far the, the townships, for instance, have grown beyond the existing service boundary, if you have to put your arm around all of that, what's the cost going to be uh, to treasury, uh, to, to us as taxpayers? We have no idea as far as that's concerned. Funding issues, I mentioned funding issues of Dora. Of the 7 and 12 year contracts, we have to have more finality around what type of escalation formula we can expect in these contracts. Um, what are the drivers of complexity in the current contracting system? The funding constraints imposed by Treasury, the complexity of, uh, of arriving at an acceptable solution for formula and less formal industries, the cost increases are not adequate, adequately covered in these proposed documents, and so on. Um, and then I've just listed the main issues, the uh, five top issues that I've used, and I've listed them under governance issues, contract issues, and so on. I've said that, so I'm going to repeat it. So, what are the conclusions? We are very concerned about the changes that were made in the proposed tender negotiated contract documents, the four that we've mentioned, that the substantial required uh, discussion. These were really meaningful uh, changes uh, <coughs> affecting. Uh, the essence of how we would see contracting in the future in the industry, and we have to deal with that. Road safety initiatives were put to the DOT and RTMC. We'd like to have some response, at least get some. Curtis said, so yes, we've received this. Uh, we'll follow up on this. But we believe we've made meaningful contributions based on best practices internationally and how to improve safety in public transport. And in some sections, the Consumer Protection Act have major implications for the industry. I've mentioned that. The sooner we address these, the better. The most notable issue is the lack of sustainable and adequate levels of funding. And if I say sustainable, then you have to look at the longer term. But adequate to fund the public transport system that we need for the country. Lack of capacity to implement the chosen policy direction, the integrated transport plans. Our major operational issues in the permit offices. This has been done for years, but nothing seems to be, do, to be done about that. The lack of policy direction at the rich levels of government, complexities regarding the integration of informal taxi service into the formal subsidized industry, the lack of progress made for development and implementation of integrated transport plans, the funding of public transport is a political decision in our view. It can only be solved at that level. Um, and, uh, we cannot solve it as an industry, we can give inputs point out the implications of it, but it's a political decision at the end of the day. Uh, yesterday, uh, probably Gordon did say there's lots of money in the system. 
so you can fund you can fund this. Like if it's, it's, it's the more power to do it completely with public transport. And maybe the university's public transport plans are too ambitious for South Africa and its current developmental state. It's rather go slower and too fast. And the Cape Town example I think is the right, the right decision to uh, do it there um, and see what the issues are, what's going to cost us and so on. Uh, one potential solution would be to create more capacity at the local, virtual, national public transport level and specifically the metro level, we can have really capacitated transport authorities. Now it's good to hear that the Minister for Hotting is talking about uh, transport authority for the province, because we have so many metro areas that you have to integrate and coordinate. We have such duplication in resources in doing that. We have one transport authority for the entire province, to make a huge difference. And this 25 year uh, hotting uh, public transport strategy that we've been working on, uh, hopefully will address this institutional aid. Because I think a lot of the failures that we have in implementation is really because we don't have adequate uh, institutional structures that are capacitated to actually take on this job, implement, monitor, adjust, and so on. And these authorities must also transcend political changes and, uh, and provide more stability of the medium to so know where they are. And uh, we don't have to change in these authorities every time we have an election. And, and I mean, the first year after the election, and the year before the election takes place, nothing really happens. That's controversial. And you only have a three year period. So we, we, we need to move beyond that and work with the policy frameworks that's been given. And lastly, it's important that clarity be obtained about the role of the respective modes of transport have to play in the future. The current policy statements are too ambiguous and not well thought through and cause uncertainty and distrust. Thank you.